So today we're going to talk about one of those quintessentially economic topics, money. Money is one of the things that most people think about when they think about economics and when they think about an economics class. But we're now into the like the 14th week of class and we haven't talked at all really about money, at least not that much. Not really about what money is or what money does for us or what makes for good money. I mean, if we think about what makes for good money, there's, there's so many things that could apply. This is it's kind of my, I wouldn't call it a safe, but kind of a, a treasure box of, of things that I've collected over the, the course of time. And um, one of the things that's in this box are different kinds of money. So let, let's see here. Let's open this guy up and see what we can, we can uh, pull out of here. Uh, ah, so here... Uh, I've got a, uh, a stack of silver coins. I don't know how many there are here, but these are uh, supposedly, at least, 99% uh, silver. These are um, one half of a troy ounce of silver, and there's a bunch of them in here. Um, these are like real silver coins. Uh, I certainly wouldn't take these and try to put them in a vending machine or really even buy anything with them. Um, these are things that I have bought for, um, I guess, for investment purposes, if you want to call it that. But silver is something that we used to use as, uh, as, as money, as currency. These are, uh, I'm not sure what these are. These are some kind of other silver coin, um, some amount of weight, and a few more of them. Um, I also have here a one troy ounce of fine gold. It's sealed in plastic here, probably. Um, just to make sure that the uh, integrity of it remains the same. But this is, I don't know if you can see with the reflection there, there's a little bit better. This is a gold, one ounce of gold. And so it's worth whatever the market is going for gold. Um, what else do I have? Ah, here I have, let's see if I can get a better view of the box here. Um, come on, box, where are you? Ah, there we are. So. In the box, I have um, uh, I have this one of these little boxes, a, a smaller box, and inside this little box, I've got a whole bunch of coins. Um, they're all kind of dirty and old, and um, they're from different parts of the world. Here's a, a five Canadian cents, but this Canadian cent is worth more than a Canadian cent today because this is from 1922. So there is some uh, investment value as part of that, but it's also made out of something uh, more tangible. This, gosh, I don't know what this one is. This is uh, something from 1890 something. Uh, this looks like it was, or is from, ah, this is from Mexico. So this must be uh, um, some sort of a peso coin. And uh, I've got other coins here from other parts of the world made of various different kinds of metal. Um, some of those are made out of the real thing. Some of those are made out of silver or copper. Um, in this bag here, I've got a bunch of other coins. Um, what do I have in here? I've got oh some half dollars. There's a Kennedy half dollar. Um, not, I mean, it's worth 50 cents pretty much. Um, I've got a bunch of those. Um, uh oh, so I've got a bunch of those. Ah. Now this little guy, this is a Liberty Dime. This is from 1945, and uh, this is made out of silver. So this is like a real silver coin. Uh, what else do I have in here? Um, oh, more Kennedy halves. Somewhere in here I have a half dollar that's worth more than the Kennedy halves because oh, there's a silver quarter from 1952. So that's worth a little bit more than 25 cents because it's made out of silver. Uh, there's another Liberty Dime. Ah, that might be it right there. Yeah, there it is. The Kennedy, or this is a Ben Franklin half dollar, but because it's older, it's from 1951, it's actually made out of silver. So all these different coins have been money at different parts, uh, at different times in history. I also have some other things in here. Um, ah. Here is a stack of $100 bills. Now, I got a lot of these. Man, that's surprising. So um, there's a Ben Franklin $100 bill. 
and that's worth $100. And I can buy $100 worth of stuff there, but it's just paper. It's sort of like if I had, if I got stuck on an island somewhere with that stack of paper, I don't know if I really want it. Um, I'm not sure how much it could buy for me. If I'm on a deserted island, it probably is not worth much more than uh, something to start a fire with. I do have some other things in here. Um, I've got, let's see, I've got some old baseball cards and football cards in here. Uh, let's see here. I've got some Mario Lemieux cards. I've got some Nolan Ryan baseball cards. There's a Nolan Ryan card uh, picture for, the, uh, for a couple of different teams there. Um, oh, there's an old Nolan Ryan card when he's with the Angels. The perhaps the most valuable card in this stack. Uh, I'm not sure if this is still the truth or not, but this is a Mario Lemieux rookie card. Uh, I bought that thing for, I don't know, a hundred bucks or something uh, a long time ago. So I hope that it's worth more than what I paid for it. But if I were to try to take this thing down to the, uh, I don't know, down to the gas station and, and use it to buy, uh, use it to buy gas, I, I really wouldn't, uh, be able to get much for it because this is not looked at, uh, looked upon as currency. It's not looked on as money, even though it is valuable. In fact, a lot of the stuff in this kind of treasure box, I couldn't spend very easily. I, I would have a really hard time uh, trying to f spend this. Uh, this looks like maybe a, a whoops, well, I dropped that one. Uh, this is some kind of a coin. It looks like it maybe it's from Asia, but it's got a hole in the middle of it. Um, ah, here's a good one. This is a five cent hotel bar coin. I, I'm not even sure, you know, I, I couldn't spend that anywhere. Nobody would want that. Um, just because they look like coins, just because they, things look like money, doesn't mean they're actually useful as money. There are certain characteristics that money has to have in order for things to be worth the paper they're printed on or the metal they're minted on. So as we look now more at money and what money is and what money does for us, we want to spend a little bit more time trying to understand what makes good money. In other words, what makes something valuable to people? Um, again, you know, I've got stacks of metal that people say are precious. You know, I've got this that little gold ounce and these silver things and some paper in here. But really, what's it good for? What does money do for us? So we're going to start to explore that. And to start with our in our investigation here of money, I want to take a look at a short film clip uh, that helps us to understand that the way people view money is, is kind of a curious and um, an interesting thing. So I give you, in our beginning of trying to understand what makes money valuable, I give you the Teen Titans. Wrong! Wrong! Wrong, 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 and some wrong! Wrong! Money is not to be wasted on things that bring you happiness and joy. Money is to be hoarded until you have enough money that your money makes more money. And then you spend that money. No! You hoard that money too! Ew. This is why they say money's the root of all evil. Money? Evil? Ho, ho, ho. I know someone who might change your mind about that. No. Well, hi there. I'm money. <laughs> hi, money. Nice to meet you. Now, does someone here think I'm evil? It is him, the green one. You are evil, bro. I know your heart. Money doesn't have a heart, beast boy. Exactly. He's evil. Watch your mouth or I'll break your bones. <laughs> what I mean is, how can I be evil when I'm just a little old piece of paper? <laughs> you're not paper, you're money. Silly money. I am paper, but I'm also money. All I am is an agreed upon representative of credit. Something you trade for goods and services, so I can be anything. Even paper. Can money be a pineapple? If everyone agrees on it, sure. Can money be rocks? Absolutely. Can money be the blurt flops? <laughs> now you're talking. Can money be Robin's stupid face? Do show some respect. Call me, sir, or Dr. Money. Now kneel before me or I will destroy you all. My apologies, Dr. Money. Money's kind of creeping me out. Yeah, he's making me want to be poor. See? So clearly we have a disconnect here between what Robin thinks about money and what Beast Boy thinks about money. Beast Boy thinks that money's evil. 
And he's sort of right, but he kind of gets the quote wrong. You know, money isn't evil. At least that's not what, uh, what we learn. It's the love of money that's the root of all evil. Money's incredibly useful. In fact, money is incredibly important in an economy, as we're about to see. Um, that being said, you know, money does have the tendency to try to, 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 to kind of warp our, our view of the world and to warp the way we, um, way we value things. You know, if, if we are acting like Robin and thinking that money is, is good to be hoarded, not used to spend on the things that make us happy, then we've got a, 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 an incorrect view of money from that perspective as well. So let's take a look at what money is, what money does for us, the roles that money plays, and, and, and see if we can kind of get a better feel for what this thing is uh, that is so, well, it's important for an economy, um, but more so for the role that it plays not so much for precisely what it is. So what is money good for? Well, money actually performs three functions in an economy. The first is the most important. Money acts as a medium of exchange. And we talked a little bit about this when we talked about barter economies. If, if there isn't any money in the economy, then what has to happen in order to get the things that you want is you have to trade what you have to get what you want. And if you don't have what somebody else wants, then you have to trade what you have to get something else that the third party wants. It becomes rather hectic and rather confusing. Money acts as this kind of middle ground. So if you are a baker and you want a steak for dinner, you don't have to take the bread down to the butchers and then negotiate a price, how many loaves of bread for a steak. What you do is you bake bread, you sell it for money, and then you take that money and go buy the steak. Money is the kind of the middleman of the exchange. It's a medium of exchange. It allows trade to happen more easily. And that's clearly the most important role that money plays, the most important function. But it's not the only function. Money also acts as what we call a unit of account. And a unit of account is, it's still pretty important. It's an important role that money plays. To get a perspective on the unit of account, let me ask you this question. Here we have a very cute dog. This dog was uh, has one unique and important um, function or important um, thing about it. And that is that this, this dog is the dog that has fetched the highest price for any dog ever. So what I want you to do is just to think for a second, how much would you pay for this dog? Now, you've got an idea about how much you would pay for the dog, and so do other people in the class. I know how much I would pay for the dog. And if I were to tell you how much I would pay for this dog, it might be more than what you would pay. It might be less than what you would pay. But because I'm, uh, I'm phrasing it in a dollar term, it allows us to, to get a feeling for how much somebody values this animal. If I were to tell you I would pay, you know, like five bucks for this dog, it would give you an idea that I don't value the dog very much. If I were to tell you I'd pay, say, $5,000 for the dog, you might say, oh, well, that's, that's a different story. You must really want this dog. You must really look at this dog and say, that's a, that's a fine animal, and that would make me happy. So now that you've thought about how much you would pay for the dog, and again, maybe it's not very much at all, or maybe it's an awful lot, let me tell you how much somebody actually did pay for this dog. The answer is $1.5 million. Now, I don't know about you, but that's far, far greater than what I would pay for this dog. And so it tells me two things about the person who paid that amount of money for this dog. One is that they really, really, really wanted this dog. And the second thing is they're probably a little bit crazy because $1.5 million for a dog is insane. But if we were to say that they would pay 1.5 million oranges for this dog, or 1.5 million uh, tadpoles for this dog, or 1.5 million used car tires for this dog. That wouldn't really tell us much. It would be hard for us to get a feel for how much the person really values this dog. 
but $1.5 million, because it's a common frame of reference, because it is a unit of account, now we've got, a, we've got an idea about how much somebody truly values this animal. And that's one of the important things that money does for us. So it acts as a medium of exchange, it acts as a unit of account, and then third, thirdly, it acts as a store of value. Now, there is a caveat here. Money acts as a store of value as long as there's not a whole lot of inflation. As we've talked about in the past, if inflation is really high, it means that the value of money is going down. If the value of money is staying relatively constant, then money can act as a store of value because it acts as a way for us to save for a rainy day. We can take our money, stick it in our, our nice little, you know, kind of treasure box. We can keep it there for a while until we have enough money to buy the things that we want. So I've got, you might have been surprised at that, that amount of paper money that I had in my little box here. Well, I'm, I'm saving for something. And because I know that inflation isn't very high, I'm just putting it in my box and saving it for when I have enough to buy the thing that I want. Money acts as a store of value, as long as there's not a lot of inflation. So those are the three roles that money plays for us in an economy. And if money, if the things we use as money can't do these three things, or it can only do one or, or two of the three, then it's not going to be a really good thing to use as money. That being said, some things work better as money than others. You maybe caught uh, Raven's question in that, in that uh, clip that we just saw about the Teen Titans. Raven asks, can pineapple be money? And Robin says, yeah, sure, if everyone agrees on it. What makes good money? I don't want to carry pineapples around as money because they don't really have the the good characteristics. Pineapples just, they're missing something when it comes to, to money. What makes good money? Well, there's lots of things that can be used as money. We see some of them up here on the screen. We see cigarettes and maybe you've seen prison movies and of course in prison movies cigarettes are used as mediums of exchange because cigarettes surprisingly have a, almost all of the characteristics of what makes good money. This jar over here, this jar of uh, old smoky moonshine, that's a form of money, or at least it can be, because it has some of the characteristics of what makes good money. These stones down here, these are, are rocks on the Isle of Yap and uh, a South Pacific Island. It's a little bit hard to tell um, how big those are. So let me let me, to the best of my ability, draw in a person here to give you an idea about how big these rocks are. A person on the Isle of Yap might be about like this compared to that stone. These are giant, giant rocks, and they have been used for, for centuries as money, as currency on the Isle of Yap. I don't know about you, but... These giant rocks seem like they wouldn't be the best kind of money in the world, and they really, they really aren't. But they're still used as money. This book over here, this is the cover of a book in a, in a not in a trilogy, but whatever, a two-book series, in a two-book series um, by Bethany Wiggins about a dystopian future where the coin of the realm, basically the money, is honey. If you have a beehive and the bees are producing honey, then you become incredibly wealthy very quickly. Bees are so highly valued that the byproduct of the bee, the honey, becomes money. And some of the characteristics of what makes good money can be found in honey, but not all of them. So what are the characteristics of something that we want to use as money if it's going to be good money? If it's going to be something that's that people actually want to use as money. Well, one of the characteristics, and these are in no particular order, is that we want our money to be portable. We want to be able to move it around. This is why those rocks on the Isle of Yap are not really good things for money. They're just too hard to move. And, and the rocks, those big giant stones, they're used for major purchases, but they're not used for every day because they, 
again, they can't be moved very easily. We want to be able to pick up our money and carry it around with us. A second characteristic of what makes something good as money is that we want it to be durable. Now, those rocks on the Isle of Yap, yeah, they're really durable and that's great, but because they're not portable, it doesn't really matter how durable they are. You know, a bowling ball is durable. We don't want to use it as money. But we also don't want to put our money in, the, in our pocket, forget it's there, put it in the laundry, and then have the money turn into mush. We want whatever we use to be money to be durable. This is one of the reasons why people minted coins. Coins were made out of durable metals, and by putting them into coin form, they were became very portable. A third characteristic is we want our money to be recognizable. This is one of the reasons why on those coins we would see the faces of, of leaders. So in Roman times, you might see the inscription and the picture of the emperor. We want it to be recognizable. That's why we put symbols and pictures and, and things on the currency that we use. We want it to be recognizable as money. We want to look at it and say, I got it. I know what you're talking about here. I, I was in Canada a couple of years ago and talking to some students up there. And, um, and I bought something off of one of the students. And I said, would, would you be okay if I paid you in American money? And they said, oh yeah, that'd be fine. And they were kind of curious to see what the money would look like. And so I reached into my wallet, I pulled out a $10 bill or whatever I was using to pay for uh, this, this thing. And I said, here you go. And, and they looked at that money and they looked at me and they looked at my wallet and they said, how did you know that was a 10? And I, I said, well, there's, there's, there's number 10 on it. They said, no, no, no. When you opened your wallet, how did you know which one was which? Because they're all the same color. I said, oh, well, like all our money's the same color. But in Canada, not all the money is the same color. One way they can tell the difference of between what was a 10 and a 5 and a 20 is by the different colors. To them, that made money recognizable. To me, if I see somebody giving me change at the Walmart, in, in purple money, I start to say, whoa, 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 that, that's not money to me. It's not recognizable to me. We want our money to be recognizable. We want to be able to look at it and say, I know what I'm dealing with. I know what I have here. I don't have to scratch my head and say, oh, is that really money? And then finally, our fourth characteristic of money is that we want it to be easily divisible. And what I mean by that is we want to be able to break it down into smaller units. We do this with coins, we do this with paper money. So you have a $100 bill, it can be broken into 50s and 20s and 10s and 5s and occasionally a 2 and a 1. We have change so that we can, we can break our currency down into smaller units so we can make smaller or larger purchases. This is one of the values of having metal as your coins. You could shave the coin down and you could have smaller coins that would represent smaller amounts or smaller values. If we were to go back to our previous slide about what makes good money, that's why cigarettes are such good money, because they have the characteristics. They're very portable. They're very uh, recognizable. They're easy to divide. They're relatively durable. This is probably the, the one area where the, the cigarette kind of lacks a little bit. Um, they can kind of get old and, and useless. But for the most part, they, they fit the characteristics that we're looking for as money. Moonshine or alcohol, any kind of alcohol, has some of the characteristics. You can easily divide it. You can have smaller containers or larger containers. Um, it's relatively portable, uh, although moving large quantities around can be um, a little bit troublesome, and it can also be illegal. Um, it's the problem, the, probably the biggest problem is recognizability. You know, what is that in that jar? Is it, uh, is it grain alcohol? Is it something that, that's much smoother? Is it just water? So we have to be able to taste it and test it to make sure we know what we're getting. So we don't use moonshine as, as money all that often because it just doesn't, you know, it, oh, it's okay, but it doesn't fit the characteristics as neatly um, as we would like it to. Again, the rocks on the Isle of Yap, all kinds of problems there. Honey, um, it's certainly recognizable. It's You can break it into smaller units. 
Uh, it's relatively portable, but it's not incredibly durable. Honey can go bad, but it takes a long time for honey to go bad. So honey actually makes sense in terms of using it as money. It fits the characteristics of what makes good money. Portability, durability, recognizability, and divisibility. And of course, that's mainly those are those are uh, those characteristics fit the type of money that we have, the metal that we use for coins, the paper that we use for money. Money, the money that we have adopted over time is money that fits these characteristics. Now with that in mind, let's hear the rest of the story about what happens when Beast Boy convinces the rest of the Teen Titans that maybe the things that we're using for money now are not the things that we should be using money, are not the things that we should be using as money. Ah, looks like someone bought some pizza. Well, in the spirit of commerce, may I buy a slice? Sure, dude, that'll be five bees. What? Five bees for the slice of pizza. Bees? <laughs> How about I give you a dollar? Ha! We only take real money here. Bees, brah. Bees aren't money, brah. You said it yourself, Robin. Money represents credit, so money could be anything. I choose bees. But bees are not an agreed-upon currency! No one is gonna pay you in bees! Ooh, may I have a triangle of the pizza? Sure thing! Five bees, please! No! Look, I don't have any bees. How about flies? Will you take three flies for a slice? <laughs> three flies won't buy you anything! like a slice, but all I've got is a queen bee. Here's your pizza, and here's your change. Two bumblebees. Hey, didn't I give you a queen? My bad. I owe you a wasp. Mm, ouch. Mm, ow, ow. Mm. This is ridiculous. I'm not using bees as currency. Sounds like someone needs to learn to respect money. The bee money. Ow! I only respect paper money. We'll see where that gets you. Ouch. So Robin has stumbled onto a problem here. It seems that the rest of the Teen Titans do not want to use paper money as currency. And that is perhaps the most important reason that money is valuable in the first place. Money is valuable in part because of something that we call fiat money. Fiat versus commodity money is a, is a distinction that we have, uh, we've made over the course of, oh, about the last, oh, 50 years or so. Fiat money is money that government declares to be valuable, whereas commodity money is money that is valuable because of what it is. So, for example, I've got, like I said, I showed you a little bit ago, I showed you these silver coins. These coins are valuable because of the metal that they're made out of. Similarly, you know, this little gold, troy ounce of gold is valuable in part because of what it's made out of, because of that, the gold. And these precious metals are things that people want to have, even if they're not made out of metal, or even if they're not money. So the, um, you know, the coins themselves, the metal themselves are, um, are useful for a number of different reasons. We can say that um, those coins are, uh, they're good conductors of electricity. They're good, they have in industrial uses. They have, um, they have um, just properties that people find valuable. You can make jewelry out of them, whatever. So when we look at, um, when we look at these, these coins, when we look at the, the metal that they're made out of, Say those are valuable because of what they are. They're, they're, they have commodity value. The paper, on the other hand, you know, this particular piece of paper, if I am stuck on a deserted island somewhere, this paper doesn't do much for me. Now, I can't eat it. 
you know, it doesn't taste very good. There's no nutritional value. I could perhaps maybe put together some sort of covering for myself out of the paper. I could certainly use it to start a fire, but really that's all it's good for. There, there's no, um, there's no intrinsic value to this. There is intrinsic value to the coin. The coin has value because of the metal that it's made out of. The paper has no value, and there's no support for this. There's no, um, you know, there's nothing that says if you take this to the bank, there is an amount of gold that supports this currency, this this piece of paper. You can buy gold with it, but it's not backed by anything except for the promise that the government will honor this. In fact, if we look very closely, let's see if we can pull it up here in the right place, you will see uh, right about here, right there, it says that this, getting too close, I think, this is good for all debts, private and public. So this statement right here. right there. Let me read it to you. It says, this note is legal tender for all debts, public and private. What that means is that the government says this is valuable. And that's the only reason it has value. Well, not the only reason, but it is one of the more important reasons it has value because the government tells us it has value. The second reason money has value is because it's scarce. Now, we presume that it's scarce. We've talked a little bit, little bit about this as well. If money isn't scarce, if it's as common as the leaves on the trees, of course, it's not very valuable at all. Money is valuable. Money maintains its value in part because it is scarce, in part because of that scarcity. So not everybody has a money tree. In fact, nobody has a money tree. And you're not supposed to counterfeit money because if you counterfeit money, that makes it less scarce. That's one of the reasons why counterfeiting is such a heinous crime and it's treated with such seriousness. If you're printing money and trying to pass it off as the real thing, you're not just hurting the people you're giving the fake money to. You're hurting everybody because it is causing the value of money to decline because it's not as scarce. So money's valuable because government says it's valuable. Government's, uh, money is valuable because of its scarcity. But perhaps the most important reason money has value is because of what Robin just found out. If people don't believe that money has value, then money doesn't have value. If people believe that bees are money, if, and enough people believe that, then bees become money. There was this story of, um, of a problem with money that occurred in Siberia a number of years ago now. And because there wasn't enough money and because people weren't being paid, a number of public officials, a number of, of public employees went on strike. Some of those employees were teachers. And after a couple of weeks, the government said, oh, we've had about enough of this. We better pay these people. And so they offered to pay them in the currency of the country, which, because it's Russia, was a ruble. The thing is, people stopped believing that the ruble had much value. And so they demanded to be paid in something other than the money of that country, other than rubles. And so when asked, what do you want to be paid in? the teachers got together and came up with a list of three things. They said, we want to be paid in vodka. In other words, they wanted that kind of clear liquid. That's They prefer that to the money of the country. And the government officials said, well, we're Russia. Yeah, we got vodka. We can pay you in vodka. What else do you want? And they said, we want to be paid in grave plots. They wanted cemetery plots because land was valuable. And the government said, well, we're Siberia. We got nothing if we don't have land. So sure, no problem. Anything else? And kind of ironically, considering the times in which we are currently living, 
the teachers in Russia wanted to be paid in toilet paper. Now, if you think about money as being made out of paper, the fact that these teachers wanted to be paid in toilet paper instead of paper currency gives you some idea about how much people believed that paper currency was worth. It was basically worth less to them because they didn't believe it had value. They stopped believing in the value of the country's currency. And when people stop believing, your country has big problems. We've actually seen this in a number of places around the world. We've seen this in places like Venezuela, where people simply don't want the currency. They want something else. We've seen this in places like Zimbabwe, in those countries where inflation was just running so rampant that people would rather have anything but the paper currency that the country was offering. We've seen this in places where people just gave up on the belief that the government could do anything to help economic activity. And as I mentioned, if that happens, your country's in a very dangerous place. So let's take a look at one last clip here uh, involving money. It's going to actually mention a very interesting event uh, that I want you to pay attention to. So here we go with one last Teen Titans clip involving money. I don't care if he repaired my insoles. Taking a dude's feet off, that just ain't right. <gasps> We've been robbed! What criminal fiend would dare steal from us? Hey, I ain't no fiend! I'm a leprechaun! And I just sold all of that junk! Dude, you sold all our stuff for cash? Cash? <laughs> oh, why would a leprechaun want cash? I traded it for gold! He's been overtaken by the leprechaun's lust for gold. Hmm, yes, sir, oh, shiny, shiny, but you can't have any. It's mine, all of mine! We don't want your gold, fool. Well, you should. I'm getting us back on the gold standard. What is exactly this golden standard? It's the monetary system where paper money got value directly related to gold, you dummies. You tell me a dollar is worth 25 and 8 tenths grains of gold, we all know what's what. But that dirty President Nixon back in 71 unilaterally took the entire country off the standard. And ever since then, we've been based on the dollar value on a freely floating exchange rate. Ah! The money ain't tied to a specific item of value, and it's all make-believe numbers and market manipulations. But now, me and my gold will be safe from financial ruin. How you like that, President Nixon? Ha! Back on the standard, baby! Beast Boy has escaped over the rainbow and into the Federal Reserve Bank of Jump City. <gasps> he truly is attempting to restore the gold standard. Not on my watch. We need to catch him, secure his three wishes, and use one to release him from the Leprechaun curse. But to beat a Leprechaun, we must become Leprechauns. Ready, lads and lassies? Aye! Whoa. Well, Beast Boy had some of it right there. We are no longer on the gold standard. That's the difference between fiat and commodity money. And he also had it right that Nixon did take us off the gold standard back in 1971. The question is whether we want to be on a gold standard or not. There's lots of controversy over that particular question. But it is an interesting idea. If we tie the value of our money to something like gold, and we continue to have a stable supply of gold, we may never have inflation again. But it also limits us significantly in terms of what we can do with the money supply in order to affect the economy. And so that's where I want to go now. I want to take a look at, um, at who's in charge of controlling the money supply and what it is, what it is that they do to keep our, our money supply scarce, to, to keep the value of the money relatively high. So what we're going to do now is we're going to kind of shift gears from what makes good money to who is in charge of controlling the money supply. And then eventually we're going to get to the point of what do they do to control the money supply. But first of all, we need to talk about the Central Bank of the United States, better known as the Fed. 
The Fed, or the Federal Reserve Bank of the United States, is one of these institutions, or one of these kind of, kind of parts of government that is responsible for controlling the money supply. Now, the Fed isn't one of the original parts of the government. In fact, the Fed um, wasn't created until 1913. And there's a lot of controversy surrounding the creation of the Fed. So the Fed is, or the Fed has been, kind of fraught with controversy from the beginning. At the beginning of the country, some people were really suspicious of having too much power in the hands of a certain, uh, in, in the hands of a few people when it came to the money supply. And so they fought very vigorously against having a national bank in the United States. One of those, one of the people who thought it would be a really good idea to have a national bank was Alexander Hamilton. He said, you got to have a bank. you got to have a, a, an organized way of setting up the monetary system, the way of doing finance in the, in the country. And Hamilton worked really, really hard to get this national bank set up. He did okay with that, but the charter of the national bank was eventually disbanded. And if you're interested in the history of this at all, of course, Andrew Jackson is one of these people who comes along and says, no way in the world should we have one of these national banks. The problem was that over time, there was such a, an uneven monetary acceptance and, and there was such an uneven and kind of uh, uncertain, uh, a lot of uncertainty surrounding the uh, what made good money and what was acceptable as money that there were these, these very uh, significant ups and downs in the economy, things that we call panics. We would have these panics where people would basically freak out where people weren't sure what was valuable as money, economy, the economy would tank and it would be a very sharp and painful thing. Now, fortunately, the panics didn't last very long, but the panics were, uh, were an indication that something was fundamentally flawed with the way the economy was set up. And one of those things was that there was just an uncertainty about money. Different states had their own money. Different banks had their own money. I was in New Orleans a number of years ago and, and went into a, an antique store and saw plantation money. People were just printing their own money. And so if you would move from one part of a state or even from one state to the next, nobody was really sure about what constituted money. Was this $20 really worth $20? I don't know. I don't know where it comes from. I don't recognize it. It doesn't have the characteristics that I want my money to have. And so the Fed, it was finally deemed that the Fed was necessary, at least a central bank was necessary. It was called the Federal Reserve Bank, and it was created in 1913. It finally went into effect in 1913 and, and got firmly established and, and approved by Congress. Now, people were still worried about the degree of um, of power in the hands of people controlling the money supply. So the structure of the Fed was set up, or the Fed itself was set up with a particular structure to try to dissuade people of these, this fear. Basically, the way things are set up, it's kind of like the way the government is set up. At the top of the Fed, you have an individual. This is... Um, this individual is sort of like the president. This is the person we call the chairman of the Fed. And today, the chairman of the Fed is a guy named Jerome Powell. You may have heard his name in the news lately. Jerome Powell is the head of the Federal Reserve, but he's not. he doesn't have uh, carte blanche as to, as to how things are supposed to work. Underneath the chairman are seven people who are known as the board, well, six people plus Powell, known as the board of the Federal Reserve Board, or the Board of Governors. These are the people who do most of the, make most of the decisions when it comes to the Fed. 
They're not the only people who make decisions, but they're the most important people who make decisions. So you have seven members, Jerome Powell and six other people, who are on the board of governors of the Fed. Each one of these people is appointed by the Senate, so they are nominated by the President of the United States, they're approved by the Senate of the United States, and these people get 14-year terms. Now, the idea behind the 14-year term is to try to prevent political maneuvering, uh, prevent politics from interfering with bank business. Because the fear, one of the fears, was that politicians would get their kind of grubby little mitts on the people running the banks, running the banking system, and they would kind of manipulate them politically. Or these would just be political hacks who were put in place. So with the creation of the Fed, each member of the board got a 14-year term. So if they thought a politician wanted them to do something that wasn't going to be in the interest of the, comp of the country, they could just simply say, no. We don't have to listen to you. I'm here for 14 years. Come talk to me when I'm getting close to the end of my term. So that was one of the, the, the ways that the creators of the Fed had to insulate this whole process from politics. Another way that they had to insulate this from politics was through a couple of other decision-making groups. One of those decision-making groups is what is called the, the Advisory Council. Now, advisory count, the Advisory Council, actually there's a lot of different Advisory Councils. These tend to come from people in academics, in business, um, with an interest, people with an interest in, in uh, monetary policy from around the country. And these people come and they give advice to the, uh, to the Fed, to the members of the board. So these are people who, um, who advise the Fed. And they are able to kind of get behind the veil of what's going on. They come in and they make suggestions. They try to give the Fed good advice. They try to keep an eye on the Fed. But these are only this is only an advisory council. So they don't get a vote on anything. But they do kind of get this opportunity to see what's going on. The other group that's part of the Fed and is very, very important is something called the Federal Open Market Committee. More often referred to simply as the FOMC. The FOMC is, is actually where most of the power in the Fed resides. But it's more than just the Board of Directors and the Board of Governors. The, the Board of Governors do things on the daily basis and kind of run the Fed on a daily basis. But what they're going to be doing, and we'll talk about their jobs here in just a minute, what the Fed is actually going to be doing is sort of following the guidance and following the direction of the FOMC. The FOMC is made up of 12 members. And we've already met seven of these people. Seven of these people come from the Fed Board, the Fed Board of Governors. So that's 12 of the seven. So those people on the Fed Board, they are important, and they get to decide what the direction of the Fed's going to be. But there are five other people who also have a say about the direction of the Fed. And to understand who those people are, we have to understand one last thing about the way the Fed is organized. The Fed is organized into districts. There are actually 12 districts around the country, and these districts are responsible for different geographic areas and the banking activity that goes on in those 12 different, um, different geographic areas. You'll notice that a good number of these districts, uh, actually districts one through six, are in the eastern time zone. So the first one up here is Boston, then we have New York, and then we have these other districts, one, two, three, four, five, and six, they're in the Eastern time zone. So half of these banks, half of these districts are in the Eastern time zone, and that just simply reflects when the Fed was created. The Fed was created in 1913, and the majority of the population still lived in the Eastern time zone. 
So you see like the Minneapolis, the, the ninth district up here is responsible for a lot of geography. And the San Francisco branch, the San Francisco district is uh, is responsible for all of the Western time zone and most of the mountain time zone. And all of the banking activity that goes on in those time zones, including Alaska, is under the control or under the, uh, the direction of this District 12. It makes you sort of think of the Hunger Games, I guess. Um, but these different districts are responsible for the activity that goes on in their geographic regions. There, there are really three districts that I want you to pay attention to, three districts that I want you to be aware of. One of them, uh, we've already mentioned here, is the San Francisco district. And the reason I want you to pay attention to that one is just because it's so big. San Francisco is the largest district. It is responsible for everything that goes, in, uh, goes on in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, in San Diego, in Las Vegas, in Salt Lake City, in Phoenix, in Seattle, in Portland. It's responsible for all of the stuff that goes on in these different cities, these big cities in the West. And that's a lot of work. The second district I want you to just be aware of is this district number four, because that's the district that Robert Morris is in. That's approximately where Pittsburgh is. It's headquartered in Cleveland. That's the fourth district. It's actually one of the smaller districts. Um, because it, in 1913, there's you got Cleveland, you've got Columbus, you've got Cincinnati, you've got Pittsburgh, you've got a lot of activity going on in that district. But the district that's most important to remember and the most important district to pay attention to is number two. The second district, the New York district, is the most powerful, the most important district of any of the 12, even though San Francisco is so much larger and uh, even though Boston is listed as number one, uh, New York is the most important because of something we were just talking about. We've got these five other people. Who are they? Well, one of the keys to understanding those five people is to know something about the New York Fed. Each one of those districts that we just looked at has a bank president or has a district president. which means there are 12 district bank presidents. The way the Federal Open Market Committee works is that you have those seven members of the Board of Governors plus five district bank presidents. These are the other five people who help to make decisions about the Federal Open Market Committee's commitment to controlling the money supply. So, who of the 12 districts gets to vote? Well, one of those people is always the New York president. This is almost like having a, an eighth member of the Fed, of the Federal uh, Governor, Board of Governors, the New York Bank President, New York Fed District President always votes on the FOMC. And I'll explain why that's the case in just a second. The remaining four are just other bank presidents. Other, you got 11 other districts, and those four others kind of rotate through. They don't always get a vote. So sometimes it's the Richmond and St. Louis and uh, say Chicago and Boston presidents. Sometimes it's the Atlanta president. Sometimes it's the San Francisco president. They all get a chance to vote, but they kind of roll on and off. So they, they sort of have um, have their turn to vote, and then they then they're off. They don't get a vote. They always get to advise. They're always in the room when debate happens, but they don't always get a vote. So the federal, uh, the governor, the board of governors of the Fed, they're pretty powerful people. But there are these other district bank presidents who have, they have some pretty interesting and strong opinions as well. And they get to provide some insight as to what the Fed does. So what is it? 
that the Fed does. What are the jobs of the Fed? Well, the most important job of the Fed is to control the money supply. That's why they were created. They're there to control the money supply, and they do this through what is called monetary policy. The Fed conducts a monetary policy, and what does that mean? It means they control the money supply. It means they count the money supply to the best of their ability. It's not their only job, but it's their number one most important job. Two of the other jobs that they play is, or that they play is that they control and regulate the banking industry. They set the rules of how the banks can operate. They also, and this is becoming more of a, of a role that we hear about uh, during these crazy Corona times, and that is that they act as a lender of last resort for other banks. So we have different kinds of banks. We have the Fed. The Fed is the central bank. They kind of oversee things. But that's not the only kind of bank. And you can't go into the Fed and open up a savings account. That's not how this works. Instead, what we see is that there are what we call commercial banks. Commercial banks are the banks that you do your banking in. This is your PNC. This is your citizens. This is your city bank. The banks where you can have an account. Those are commercial banks. They serve commercial customers. They are run like a business. There are also investment banks. Investment banks are uh, more for businesses who are looking, for, uh, looking to borrow money to expand what they do. Um, these are banks that try to court, that work in the loanable funds market where they try to get savings into the hands of investors. Um, they provide investment funding for businesses. And then you have your central bank, which is the Fed. And it's the Fed's job to keep an eye on what these different types of banks are doing. They regulate and they control what's going on. But if these other banks, if the commercial banks and the investment banks are in trouble, if they are running out of funding, if, if they are, um, if they need more money, they can go to the Fed, and the Fed acts as a bank for the banks. It's not the only place that these banks can get money. They can borrow from each other, but it's the job of the central bank to make sure that if these, two, these kinds of banks, if your commercial banks and your investment banks need money, there's a place for them to go to get it, the central bank. So that brings us to the major number one job of the Fed. And that is, of course, to measure the money supply. The Fed has to measure the money supply. Their, their job is to make sure that we don't have too much money and cause inflation. And their job is to make sure we don't have too little money, which could cause some problems as far as economic activity is concerned. What I want to talk about next time is how the Fed does this job. It sounds like it should be easy. Gosh, you just count how much money there is. Just ask how much money have we printed? How many dollars are out there? How many coins are there? But that's not really all there is to it. You probably figured that out. If, if it was just a matter of you know counting, we could have a bunch of kindergartners in a room somewhere counting the money. But there's more to counting the money than just knowing how many dollars or how many coins are out there. It centers around something we call liquidity, which we'll get to when we get back together.